Professor Steve here. Welcome everybody to the first of our biogeochemistry lectures. Um, so this unit is going to be about really uh, sort of coming full circle for the course. So we've been uh, learning about a lot of different puzzle pieces and we talk uh, essentially about all of them in terms of um, elemental cycling uh, and uh, how things go back and forth between inorganic and organic pools, and and what are the what are the, what are the biological, physical, and chemical uh, variables that drive and move these things around? And essentially, that in a nutshell is what defines biogeochemistry. And the showcase has been carbon, and for good reason. And we'll continue that theme a little bit. Um, but we need to remember that really we could be talking about any element. We're talking about biogeochemical cyclings. We're talking. About we're talking about the transformations that any element can take between one compound and another. So f this could be from an organic form to another organic form or from an organic form to an inorganic form and back again. And what we're talking about is, and, and what we really study and want to know is how much is coming into that, that cycle, um, how much is going out, how much is being stored in what pools. What are the processes here, the biological, physical, and chemical processes that, that mediate these transformations? And, and this unit is, is really about uh, bringing, you know, completing some of these pictures. Why, in other words, why do we care? Why do we study uh, the elemental cycling of any con uh, element? And, 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 um, and why do we want to know about these things? Um, so now here is a much more complete um, picture of the carbon cycle in the ocean and essentially you have all the tools to make sense of every pool here and when I say pool I mean where is something gathered up right so the pool of carbon in the atmosphere is in organic form and it's CO2 um, the pools of carbon in in the surface ocean are also can also be in organic dissolved CO2 it can be in particulate form in the in the in the form of an organism, of many different types of organism. Um, it can be in the form of um, a byproduct of an organism. And so you guys can draw these arrows between all these pools now and say not only what the pools are, whether it's a fish, a zooplankton, a phytoplankton, or a dissolved carbon dioxide, but you can also say what the arrows are, right? Um, is it photosynthesis? Is it consumption by a heterotroph? Is it death and lysis and, and biodegradation, uh, decomposition? Is it is it sinking? That kind of thing. And and these are these are the, the transformations that, that we're talking about when we look at this this diagram here. What are each one of these arrows and what does it mean when one thing moves from one pool to the other? And in describing the um, the biological carbon pump we've sort of We've sort of done that for this, but this is the first time we've sort of put it all in one gigantic thing, including uh, the physical transformations that and physical uh, mixing and the and the, uh, the physical components that come to completing this cycle, including things like um, sinking to the seafloor, including things like uh, mixing of the surface with the deep by deep water formation or mi mixing of the deep with the surface through upwelling. And of course, there, th this, this cycle doesn't just belong to the ocean, but we have a terrestrial carbon cycle as well, right? Um, we have photosynthesis, we have terrestrial plant life, primary producers. Um, it, they too interact with the dissolved carbon pool in the atmosphere. The car um, they interact with the soil, not the deep ocean, but with the soil. And the whole thing uh, forms a, a gigantic cycle. Um, exactly like like in the ocean well not exactly like but similar to and in the same ways but with different players and a few different uh, phenomenon or processes is in the ocean and of course the the, the cycle's not complete until you link the two right um, you have a complex carbon cycle biogeochemical cycling of elements that are associated with with carbon as well in the, ter in the terrestrial environment, you have it in the oceanic environment, and it's the way the two mix that complete the global cycle. And so the types of things we're going to look at today are um, a little bit in more detail about how, how the, these, these pools exchange and what that means um, on a global scale. 
okay, so the, so the reason we would even bother studying something like this. And we've hinted at it and talked about all these things already, but we're just kind of drawing, drawing them all together and kind of making a, one big picture out of it today. So one of the first ways we're going to begin to do this is by actually assigning numbers, okay? So if we add up all the carbon in a pool, all the CO2 molecules, all the carbon in the CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, all the carbon in the, in the ocean and the different components of the ocean, the deep in the surface, all the carbon in the soil, all the carbon in the terrestrial plants, what kind of numbers are we talking about? And it turns out the numbers are, are really, really big. Um, and we're going to talk in terms of gigatons. Um, a ton is 2,000 pounds. A gigaton is 1 billion tons. So 1 billion times 2,000 pounds of carbon per year is sort of the, uh, the, the rate that the kinds of rates we're looking at. But when we're talking about a pool, we're talking about gigatons. So that if you add up all the carbon in the CO2 in the atmosphere, we're talking about, about around 800 gigatons of carbon. So that's a lot of carbon floating around us as a whole. Um, if you add up all the biomass um, in the terrestrial plants, you get about 500 gigatons of carbon. So you see, these are kind of, they're not the same number estimate, but, but, but they're relatively similar, right? They're, they're within a couple hundred of each other. If we add up all the carbon in the surface ocean, so that's CO2 um, plus particulate organisms plus dissolved carbon, all of it, um, we, we're looking at around a thousand gigatons. So we're starting to get a little bit higher. But it's not until we get into the deep ocean where we add up all the dissolved carbon, all the particulate carbon, and it, and it turns out to be around 38,000. So if you add these two together, the ocean in and of itself, you can already see, makes up about 40 times the carbon as if you added the atmosphere and the terrestrial plants all together. So this vastly outweighs those two even put together, and so you'll start to see a little bit of a theme here, and we'll talk about it some more in a minute. Um, there's a lot of carbon tied up in the reactive sediments, so this is that, that part of the benthic um, and sediment environment that's still being utilized by the bacteria through diagenesis and all the organisms that are playing through the food web. So there's a lot of carbon tied up in there, but 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 this doesn't readily exchange with with upper water column, and it certainly doesn't make it to the atmosphere very often. So same thing with terrestrial. There's a lot of soil tied up with the carbon, but it doesn't go. It doesn't flux in and out of the soil very quickly. Um, so the, the anything that's going to make it from the from the sea floor up takes a long time. Anything that's going to make it from the soil up is going to take a long time. And the majority of carbon on Earth is actually tied up in bedrock. So something that's going to be there for a very very long time um, in in geological time scales. And these are the things we're going to talk about now. So where did the carbon come from, especially in the atmosphere? And, it, and it's, it's actually from volcanoes, what we call volcanism or outgassing. So for millions, billions of years, outgassing from volcanoes, which comes from the cooking of bedrock. So, so it comes from our core, all that heat melts, rises up, forms volcanism. And we talked about those dynamics in plate tectonics, vents all the gases out, and for millions, billions of years has been putting at about uh, 0.04 gigatons of carbon into the air per year. Okay, So from there, <coughs> the CO2 can um, exchange with plants on a rather, on a relatively rapid time scale, right? Carbon is pretty quickly taken up by, by plants and the on the earth and from there it can also be sucked up by the ocean relative, relatively rapidly. Okay so we're talking about um, the longest time scale uh, as if the, the carbon makes it into the ocean through the processes we talked about makes it to the deep ocean that's the longest it's going to ever take to interact between these two and that we talked about that, that being on time scales of 500 to 1000 years and why is that you know the answer to that because the deep ocean circulates on about 1000 years right the ocean's going to anywhere between 500 and 1000 years is going to take for this part of the ocean to go somewhere like maybe the indian ocean or the or the northern pacific and surface in thermal hairline circulation and when it surfaces it brings the carbon back up okay once once carbon becomes soil or bedrock or sinks to the deep ocean and gets buried, removed through burial, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years before it before it'll ever see the atmosphere again. 
So this was the, the balance that was occurring before humans came along. And you can see that they are putting, they, when, when we started our industrial revolution and learned about combustion, we started adding many, many times the, the natural amount of carbon back into the atmosphere. All right, so this is 150 times the natural amount of, of carbon being dumped into the atmosphere, right? Mostly in the form of, of CO2. What is carbon locked up in the ocean? The majority of it is either CO2 or, or phytoplankton. That's why I put that guy there. What is it locked up, up in, in, the, in the deep ocean? It's either CO2 or, or marine microorganisms or marine snow, right? The sink, sinking detritus. Okay. So what does all this mean um, in, terms of, um, in terms of climate? How does this affect our climate? So we need to look at the rates at which they exchange and how the balance works. As I said, it would take a very it takes a long time for carbon to from the atmosphere to end up in the surface ocean and ultimately end up as an exchange with the deep ocean, right? That's biological carbon pump and then once it does it's a th it's 500 to 1000 years. It takes even longer for carbon that to exchange between the atmosphere and and the bedrock because once it's buried and removed it has to be has to travel through plate tectonics come up through the earth and vent out through volcanism and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years if not millions so what's controlling our climate um, is is the amount of carbon in the in the atmosphere the co2 and what's controlling that it are the pools that can exchange carbon with the atmosphere on rapid time scales and those two things are the surface ocean <coughs> and and terrestrial biomass. So when we look at it in terms of how quickly they turn over, it's actually relatively slowly with, even though there's a lot of plant mass in the terrestrial bio, uh, biomass and the primary producers on, on land, they exchange carbon very slowly with the atmosphere because of their biomass turnover is very long. We talked about this. Um, trees uh, take a hundred years to grow to, f to adulthood and can take hundreds of years before they die, before they die and decompose. So it's not until they've taken up carbon, grown, died, decomposed, and recycled carbon back to the atmosphere that they've completed a cycle, and that happens on terms of hundreds of years. Whereas the biomass in the in the surface of the ocean is phytoplankton, which turn over on timescales of days. Entire populations grow and die and decompose in days, and this happens year after year. So the rapid turnover from here is very, very, um, is a very, very, because this is such a rapid turnover, it has the potential to exchange carbon much more rapidly with the atmosphere. And that combined with the sheer amount of carbon that can be locked up as a whole, so not only can this exchange rapidly, but it can also remove some of it to the deep on long time scales into this gigantic pool. So and the fact that the rapid, um, the rapid exchange combined with the, 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 the large pool relative to these two pools means that the ocean has a much stronger control over the balance of carbon in the atmosphere with the earth and the atmosphere uh, um, than does any other pool including including terrestrial biomass and it is this balance um, that we know for at least, that we have records for at least the last 420,000 years that has controlled our climate. So every 20,000, 100,000, and approximately um, 400,000 years, we have ice ages, mini ice ages um, and large ice ages, and we can track them all through, um, through CO2 in, in that we can measure in ice cores that are drilled. So if we measure the CO2 in the ice cores, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down over the scale of hundreds of thousands of years, and it's this balance between terrestrial carbon, the atmosphere, and the surface ocean that has helped control this. And for 420,000 years, it's gone basically back and forth between the same two points, and it's meant the difference between um, an ice age or a warm age where essentially we are now. And if we look here, um, 
this is the present day, so this is going back in the past, and this is the present day, due to our increase of carbon into the atmosphere, um, the levels are much, much higher than they ever have been historically. And we'll talk about this in much more detail in, a, in, um, in one of the next lessons. All right, thanks a lot for joining me.